Uh, my name is Thor Rollins, and I'm the biocompatibility expert at Nelson Laboratories. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about what is material characterization and how to use kind of material characterization. So the first question I have is how many people out here have, have ever done material characterization or heard about material, material characterization? Okay, how many people want to know more about material characterization? Hopefully everybody. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of background of how we're going to talk about today because material characterization is a very broad term, but it basically means to characterize every single material in your device. And there's a lot of ways you can do that, but the one way we're going to kind of talk about today is extractables and leachables. Okay? And that's based off ISO 10993-17 and 18. So if you want to kind of get an idea of what extractable to leachables are, that's one of the standards you can do to help look into that. There's also some ESP standards that have you give a background and a basis of what extractable leachables are. Um, and we're going to kind of cover these in kind of a high level. Any good extractable leachable program is going to be kind of specialized to your material and application. So what we're going to talk about today is going to be kind of a general outline of how Nelson Labs perceives material characterization specifically to extractable leachables. But really, when we talk to the individual companies about their devices, how it's used, and what materials are in their devices, we come up with a uh, test plan. So we really have to kind of, kind of have a, a customizable test plan, even though we can't work on generalities. Okay, the first thing that we have to cover is the difference between extractables and leachables. And this is something that some people don't understand that there is a difference. So what extractables are, are chemicals that can come off your device under exaggerated conditions. So there's different ways we can do this. We can either increase the temperature and time of extraction, or we can use a very harsh solvent or liquid to try to get as much chemicals off your device as possible. The other one, the leachables, are chemicals that will come off your device under clinically simulated conditions. So we look at your device and we say your device is used like this in the clinical situation and we try to mimic the time and temperature and the solvents or the liquid involved in the clinicals. Now for this reason, leachables are always a subset of extractables, right? You're always going to get more off on your extractable uh, case than you will with your leachables. So one of the things we can do is we can actually run the extractables test to look at what comes off and then if, you, if you're safe using the extractable profiles, then that should cover your leachables. So that's one way to kind of look at the testing is looking at what, what you want to get off of it. Do you want to see worst case extractables or do you want to look at the clinical si uh, simulation? You do have to be careful with extractables. You can go way overboard. You can actually kind of melt the plastic down into a liquid, and really what kind of useful data are you going to get out of that? Unless that's your end purpose. You really want to dissolve everything and see what's there. But when you're looking at leachables, you really want to see what comes off a medical device that would impact the patient. Right? You want to see toxicologically what is the chemicals coming off that are concerning. So these are the kind of how the 17 and 18 are broken up. So 10093-18 kind of gives you a list of chemistry techniques that we can use to help identify what those compounds are. Okay, so when we look at a um, an leachable extractable uh, program, what we do is we want to extract your device, right? So we want to put it in some kind of liquid at some temperature and time and pull off those chemistry, those compounds. So now we're set with the solution of chemistry off your device. The next step, and probably the, one of the hardest things to do, is be able to identify and quantify what those compounds are. Because that doesn't really help us if we're left with a bunch of solution if we can't tell you what's in that solution. So Dash 18 gives us some chemical techniques that we can perform to try to identify and quantify those compounds in your solution. Some of these more common ones are the leach the um, you, the GCMS, which looks for volatile and semi-volatile compounds, HPLCs, FTIR, these compound, these techniques help us identify what's in that solution, okay? And then quantify those compounds. Dash 17 then takes that data and actually uses it for some kind of good output. So try to identify these compounds and what concern they are to the patient from a toxicological endpoint, okay? So we're not going to talk much about the Dash 18 today. 
about how to develop an extraction. I mean, we can do that on a one-to-one -one basis if you're interested, but like I said, each one of those is going to be different. Um, an air tube, for example, that delivers oxygen to a patient is going to have a different test system than a permanent implant. So we can have that discussion later, but at this point, we're going to go right into how to evaluate those uh, toxic substances um, to kind of save time. So I give a real life example first off on how we evaluate these compounds coming off a device. The first device we're going to talk about today was extracted in hexane. Now hexane is a very harsh solvent and so it can extract a lot of compounds off that won't be extracted in let's say alcohol or water, water but there are other compounds that uh, will only be extracted off in alcohols, for example. So that's why it's important to kind of have an idea of what solvent you want to use when performing a test up front. But this device was extracted in 62 mils um, of device. So we received 53 micrograms per liter of a certain compound off this device. And so what we did is we have to determine how much of uh, this compound is coming off of one device. So we look at how much was extracted, how much volume we had, which was 62 mils. So we took that 53 micrograms times the 0 0.062, so that would put us into liters, and that gives us 0 0.0033 milligrams coming off a device. So that kind of tells us how much of this certain compound is coming off of the device. So the test shows us that 0 0.0033 mil uh, milligrams was coming off of this one device of this compound. So then what we have to do is look at what that means. So I can tell you that we have this much compound coming off a device, but without kind of understanding what that device or that compound is, or what the toxicological concern of that compound is, it won't help us. So we have to try to determine what that really means. I can tell you right now that I might have so much of chloroform or even a very toxic compound coming off your device, but without quantities, it doesn't mean anything to me. So I have to know how much. Um, one of my greatest examples of this is how many people have seen news programs where there's cyanide in our drinking water? And they usually lead it with the 5 o'clock news, right? Cyanide found in the drinking water and moms and daughters are screaming and telling not to drink out of the, the, right? Cyanide, like anything, can only be toxic at certain levels. So we have to know how much is there for us to determine and then what the compound is. So what we try to determine is a human daily exposure. So that basically tells us how much a human body can be exposed to a compound before it's concerning. We base this off a 70 kilogram weight. 70 kilograms is kind of an average weight for a human. But if you have a target population, like an infant or um, women or something that's target for your device, and we have to change that amount. So each, each target uh, population has a different weight that we have to use. But for a normal human exposure, we use 70 kilograms. So in this example, our human daily exposure for this device, we take that 0 0.0033 milligrams and we divide it by 70 kilograms of body weight to give us a what would be the human exposure of this compound off this device. And we've seen that at this test, it would be 0 0.000047 milligrams per kilogram. So that means that this patient, for every kilogram of body weight, is being exposed to that much milligrams off the device daily. And so this is kind of the uh, exposure. And, and so in this particular uh, instance, we're looking at DBP. Okay, it's a phthalate. I don't know how many people are familiar with phthalates, but they make plastic softs, right? In fact, if you ever had a water bottle and they're really concerned about BPA or DHP, right? And so they'll use the, the no phthalates or uh, sticker on your water bottle to try to help you con be uh, thinking that your water bottle is safe to drink out of. Well, the same kind of concern with phthalates exists in medical devices, plastics that um, are trying to make soft by these phthalates, but we have to determine how much phthalates are coming off these devices and will they impact the patient that it's being used on. In this case, if the 0 .0033 was this phthalate, then we have to determine, okay, so now we're getting this calculated um, HDE value, excuse me, of 0 0.00047 um, of exposure of this phthalate per day off the device. So now there's a bunch of different arenas you can go to to try to determine if that dose is, is safe or not. One of the ones that I like to use is ToxNet. ToxNet is a great database of a bunch of information that you can go to try to determine safe levels. 
This is what the ToxNet looks like. So if you go to the website and in the search, if you put in DBP or any of the compounds you find off of your extraction, we can, de we can detect information about safety from that compound. And that helps us determine if we're, we're coming off your device is safe. So the next part we want to look for in the ToxNet is we come down and in the ToxNet has all these different uh, databases that we can go to. So we have ToxLine, we have DART, Chem uh, D+, um, we have the HSDB, which is the Hazardous Substance da Databank, which is a good one that I like. But all of these databases will help you determine different levels of toxicity of your device. So this is some of the information in the ToxNet for this um, phthalate that we're looking for. And if you look at this particular uh, study that we found, we have something called a NOEL. If you see it right here, this stands for no ad observed, and there can be also an A in there, which is adverse effect level, which basically means that in this study, they found a level that they found no uh, adverse effect from that compound or no issues with that compound in that study. We also find things called LOWELS, which stands for lowest observed adverse effect, so the, the, the amount of compound that would cause the least amount of damage. We also have things called LD50s. Now you guys might be familiar, more familiar with LD50s they are more common. I personally don't like to use LD50s. The reason why is LD50s are basically mean that half the population had well, died of this compound. I don't like making assessment off LD50s because I don't like making assessment where half the population had an effect, right? In some cases, that's the only information we can have. So we can make uh, assumptions off LD50s. We just have to put more um, safety factors in the, in the calculation. But try to find the NOEL. The NOEL is my favorite um, endpoint to use because it means that there's no adverse effect level. The other tip I want to give you is you'll find multiple no wells for the same compound. The, co the um, tip sometimes, depending on the compound you're looking for. But what we want to see is, is does how that study mimics the use of your device. We want to find a study that has the same route of exposure or similar route of exposure of your device and the same uh, kind of similar circumstances of the study. This will mean that that no well is the most relevant to your device. Okay, so in this case, if we want to use this NOEL, we can use either 152 to 177 milligrams per kilogram. So off the top, if you look back at what our um, uh, human daily exposure was, we're looking at the exposure of this device is a 0 0.000047 milligrams per kilogram. Okay, and then looking at our NOEL, we're looking at 152 milligrams per kilogram, so way below the NOEL. Now, you might just think, okay, we're safe there, we can move on. But there are some things you've got to look at when determining, uh, when you're comparing NOELs to your uh, HDE or your, your data coming off your device. The first thing we want to do is take in mean, consideration um, safety or um, modifying factors. Okay, so we have, first off, we have this study that was done in rats. Rats are not humans, right? So we have to have a modifying factor for that. We also have to have the modif modifying factor depending on the route of exposure. Let's say your test was delivered um, interperitoneal, but your device is intravenously. Or let's say it was even an oral exposure in the study, and your device is intravenous. We got to use a modifying factor to be able to give a safety on comparing that NOEL to your device. So sometimes that modifying factor could be 100. Sometimes that modifying factor could be 1,000. Sometimes it could be 10. It's depending on the data we get and how good a data it is, how high quality, depending on the route of exposure of your device. But even in this particular case, when we're looking at comparing the amount of the NOEL compared to what we got off the device, we have such a huge uh, difference between the two that any modifying factor would give us enough uh, margin of safety to be able to declare this compound not an, an issue. So, to give this an example, our NOEL was 152 milligrams per kilogram. Our HDE was the 0.00047 milligrams per kilogram. Even with the um, margin of safety, without the margin of safety factors, we're looking at 320 or 3 million times safe um, as a factor compared to the NOEL versus the um, amount coming off the device. So even if we had to put safety factors in there, we're still safe for this particular compound. 
So when you're looking at ISO 2973, 17, and 18, we would run the extractions off the device, we would analyze the compounds coming off, and then we would run through the same calculation for each compound. And we would determine a margin of safety or um, a risk assessment for each one of those compounds coming off your device. The concept at Nelson Labs is we can actually help you run this um, yourselves to be able to help determine each compound coming off. And if there's a large risk, if there's a large area of safety for each one of those compounds, then you can be pretty confident that you've done a good job evaluating this device. If we start getting to where there's one or less than one risk assessment or margin of safety, then at that point we actually recommend turning over to a board certified toxicologist to be able to help in that determination. It's also important to determine the chemistry techniques used to make sure you're able to identify all the compounds coming off. For example, with metals, we use something called ICPMS to be able to detect the metals coming off a device. You can detect a limited set of metals, or you can go to a very large set of metals. We would recommend trying to detect as many metals that could be on your device as possible, especially when looking at the materials you're using and the processing you're using to be able to not overlook a metal that might be coming off your device. Because if we're not looking for it, it's not going to show up on the scan, and then we can't do any tox information, but it could still cause issues long term in the patient. So I've given you some of uh, the ISO references in 10993 to be able to look back and how they evaluate. We have been successful in running material characterization and helping to justify out of some biocompatibility tests, particularly along the, toxi uh, the chronic toxicity area and some mouse micronucleus or genotoxicity tests. We've been able to use chemistry and toxicological output to be able to justify out of those tests to save time and money. Also, in, in foreign regulatory arenas like Europe, this approach is much more successful. We can be much more uh, risk evasive when we're talking about the biocompatibility tests and, uh, and using the material characterization data to make that uh, determination. Okay, well, thank you for your time.